everybody to the tech talk. Uh, Enrico is already here. Uh, I welcome him to the Pi, Pi School uh, Tech uh, Talk in this session of the School of AI. Uh, we were just waiting a couple of minutes that everybody, um, uh, so everybody will will join us. But I can, you can, uh, I can leave the floor to to Sebastian that maybe can add something about uh, these tech talks and the School of AI. Ah, okay. Well, yeah, I see a couple of uh, alumni. So welcome back. I see Francesco, Atim, Evgeny, David. Uh, welcome back, guys. Um, Thanks. Hello, hello, Sebastian, uh, and to everybody. To all people who've been here. Um, well, people actually who've come uh, physically to uh, by campus because that was pre-COVID. Um, Actually, Evgeny is probably the oldest alumna, alumnus on the call, I think. Yeah, because it's back in 2017. Yeah, better way back. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, good to have you all. Um, I don't know. Everyone knows what Pi School does, I think, on the call. So I won't be spending too much time. We do, we do rapid prototyping of AI projects and training in AI. So most of the people who are on this call here uh, have been or are working uh, on projects in this format of eight weeks where AI engineers uh, come and sort of acquire or expose their, their skills, the skills they're building um, to real projects that come from industry. Our job is to source the projects from industry, prepare them, format them so that people can then work on them um, and on the other hand, we, we select uh, AI engineers through uh, a recruitment procedure. So anyone here would like to apply to Pi School to be included maybe in the next session, uh, feel free to do so. That's all on our web page. Um, and um, we've done, we've organized nine sessions so far. We've done 76 projects, so quite quite some experience and um, happy to say that we we have about 160 alumni or we will have 160 alumni when this session closes so a sizable community here too and we regularly organize talks as part of you know what's going on uh, at uh, at Pi school tech talks and so we like to invite people from different horizons just a couple of days ago we had uh, Emanuela Girardi, who's uh, the founder of uh, Pop AI, a, an AI community that's interested in, in ethics and social aspects of AI, and um, who spoke about, who came to spoke about uh, AI policy in the EU and how it's uh, sort of uh, designed, uh, evaluated, and uh, how, how it's developing. So that was really interesting. And then we also have technical talk, like really technical as in scientific talks. A couple of days ago, we had Andrea uh, Santilli uh, from Sapienza University was speaking about um, uh, big, big language model uh, training in the Hugging Face Big Science project. Uh, so equivalents to GPT-3, but the kind of open science version of GPT-3, not the closed science version that OpenAI does. Um, and well, and today I'm uh, really happy to welcome Enrico, um, who's uh, going to speak about well language modeling too, um, from a practical point of view, and hopefully he'll also be able to show us how um, the, the the technical bits that he presents um, have applications in the in the products. Um, of the and the products of the company that uh, uh, that he's in. Enrico, I would just say over For to sure. you at this point, without wasting any any more of your time or your speaking time. Thank you very much, Sebastian, and nice to meet you. So I present directly the presentation and. So cool, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I will speak about um, transformers in general. I will start from a little uh, overview, a little um, history, let's say, 
but even if you already know everything about transformer i think that it's interesting i think uh, i try to to make a little different uh, point of views or for some aspects like transformers birth uh, and uh, and so on uh, pre-training uh, and so on so i start uh, with the just uh, uh, two slides about indigo indigo ai it's the startup that i confounded a few years ago we have a conversational ai platform so we 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 help businesses to communicate with the, their customer so you can create a, let's call virtual assistant and chatbots in it and uh, behind the platform we use uh, state-of-the-art uh, nlp models and architectures so i lead the ai team uh, research and development team and so I, all the research uh, we do some academical research uh, and then we deploy everything in uh, production um, we have uh, some customers but let's skip this part here and uh, this is the most important thing uh, um, behind uh, indigo there are a lot of uh, young and motivated people uh, very very passionate about uh, nlp natural language and so on so that's cool uh, and uh, we love ai and that's the reason that i'm here so i want to begin the um, the real stuff um, everybody um, every time that uh, we speak about nlp uh, nowadays uh, we for sure we speak about uh, transformers because they did a real revolution revolution a few years ago and they changed the a lot the state-of-the-art performances in almost every task but uh, why we use transformer was there an era before that so i want to start a very fast um, um, example on about for example text classification so the classical pipeline of text classification was uh, we have the text uh, we have to vectorize this text because we we have to create uh, a, a representation that the model the classifier for example uh, can use then we have uh, the machine learning classifier and then we we reach our classification label uh, for this vectorizing part uh, the first approach was for example the bag of words we count the word in a sentence or uh, we we take tf tfadf so we use document frequency to to adjust the weights so it was uh, a sparse uh, representation every word was uh, independent and for sure uh, it was a problem so after that uh, um, in 2013 i think uh, it was introduced uh, word to vec it was a great uh, let's say breakthrough because uh, it was the first time to use a neural approach to embed a word and to embed a word in a dense uh, dense space uh, where uh, the semantic relationship relationship and the syntactic relationship was embedded uh, was taken into account and so that was great because uh, we we were able to use for example synonyms but the problem is that uh, that was words not sentences and uh, when we communicate uh, we communicate uh, with sentences uh, but imagine uh, to do an average of these uh, word embeddings and so uh, classical approaches uh, were uh, use simple classical machine learning classifiers with this type of uh, of input so for example uh, simpler uh, simplest linear regression uh, very it was very used um, Sector of the machine, for example, other classical the classifier that you uh, see everywhere. And a little bit later, uh, well, the, the community started to use uh, neural approach also in the classifier part. So the, the most fitted network for a language was the LSTM, because it was a, spe a special kind of a recurrent neural network that mm, took the memory so um, with the lstm we were able to use the 
a whole sequence of the text, so a text seen as a sequence, and keep the memory also of the words uh, before the the word that were in that was in input in, in the LSTM. But the problem was that the performances were not so good, were not so high. So, for example, in Indigo at the beginning, uh, before the transformer era, we didn't use LSTM, we didn't use uh, neural classifiers because uh, with classical machine learning uh, approach classifier, we were able to overperform overperform the neural approaches, and that's quite a, a big thing because we are saying that uh, okay with the classical approach with the lighter uh, model faster model we reach the same performance that the big lstm network that is complicated very complicated a lot of gates functions uh, and so on and so that's the reason that when uh, transformer and attention was introduced uh, it was a real breakthrough uh, to everything change in the in the NLP field, and um, I think that you all know transformers. Uh, but the main advantages were that uh, the sentence was uh, taken uh, in its uh, entirety, so the whole sentence was uh, taken in input in the layer, and the, um, all the weights um, were uh, parallelizable. So we we could uh, faster the training. So with this um, attention was not the only aspect and thing of this great revolution, because at quite the same time, it was introduced another big, big breakthrough. That was the uh, paradigm pre-training fine tuning. I think that also uh, this is the you for sure you 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 know it but it's important to uh, understand that it was uh, um, quite uh, introduced uh, independently from uh, transformers the first uh, paper about it uh, the first model that uh, used it uh, in, a, in the right way was uh, elmo and elmo was lstm uh, architecture so nothing about uh, transformer and the the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm is something incredible because uh, in the pre-training uh, stage uh, phase the model learns the language and in the fine-tuning learns the specific task so it's quite mm, very incredible and more similar to how a human uh, reason so the human uh, learns the language and then learns the specific task and try to transfer the knowledge between the uh, what he learned in the language and the task that uh, he's doing so that's something that i love on nlp so because uh, finally we are trying to model language and the best way to do it is emulate what uh, uh, humans do how humans uh, learn language and use language in their life and i think that in all uh, pieces and modules of uh, transformers uh, pre-training uh, and so on we can see how, um, where is the inspiration and how to em emulate uh, the human's behavior. And so the, that was a, a super great idea, let's say, incredible. And um, these within transformers uh, um, started to create the large language models that we know uh, now. Uh, Vert was the in 2018, so the, the year after. And it was the mix uh, between transformers and pre-training fine tuning. And so um, for, um, let's say, finishing this first uh, uh, section and overview, uh, I finish it with a um, little uh, simple question. So which made the biggest impact, the transformer or the pre-training fine tuning paradigm? And that's the, I think that's a real interesting question. Uh, there is not a clear answer right now, but um, some researchers are starting to do papers in this direction. Uh, last year, um, they tried to uh, put uh, uh, multi-layer uh, multi perceptron in place of transformer, or for example, convolutions, or uh, Fourier transformer, 
uh, Fourier transform that is something completely different uh, from attention and transform and transform and attention finally are uh, matrix uh, products so nothing too complex and uh, it's interesting to see an alternative that is quite more mathematical let's say like Fourier transform but they they found that with these alternatives and keeping the pre-training fine-tuning paradigm, the results uh, uh, were not so different. So it's starting to, uh, to, let's say, we are starting to discover something because uh, since they were introduced at the same time, we did not uh, um, uh, separate the advantages of the on one side or the other side and so but that's very interesting okay for sure we we have not to to we cannot conclude okay transformers are not the best way uh, let's focus only on on the pre-training fine tuning because transformers are very good to create uh, themselves uh, a representation of the input on the other side uh, in fact uh, uh, some researcher try, uh, tried transformers on other uh, data source like images, uh, sounds, and so on. And transformers are very, very effective in creating their uh, own representation. And so there is something positive also for sure in transformer. But I only say this to 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 say, okay, maybe it's not so incredible to see in some time, in some years, uh, uh, most the effective alternative uh, to transformer uh, and to start on this uh, because I, I remind you if you know it the transformers and attention is uh, has a quadratic complexity so it's not a linear complexity so it's not the best way most efficient way to to do things but um, now the state of the art is transformers everything is about transformers so i want to focus on them i want to focus on them um, reaching the first uh, models in, uh, in the transformer world and that are the most used and common models uh, in the on the business side and the production side in general for sure we start from birth um, i think that um, um sometimes when BERT is introduced, uh, uh, people start from the wrong side. They start from uh, the layers, the fit forward, the uh, encoder, decoder, embedding, um, SEP token, CLS, and so on. But I think that the most magical aspect of BERT is uh, what you see on the right is the most simple exercise that uh, a person do uh, in school to learn a language because all the magics uh, between uh, behind the bird and mm, at the beginning of bird is in this type of exercise and i think that it's incredible to start from a so simple uh, exercise simple task idea to create uh, the best language model at time when it was made, let's say. And uh, another uh, incredible thing about this type of exercise uh, is this, the concept of uh, self-supervision. Until uh, some years ago, the, the machine learning world was, was separated between uh, supervised and unsupervised. OK, also reinforcement learning, but let's focus on supervised and unsupervised and uh, supervised label data and supervised unlabeled data and uh, here simply we remove we delete some words and we use these words as uh, labels in the task so the data are not are not labeled so it's unsupervised but we use the data to auto label and uh, using the label for the task and so it's in the middle. It's the self-supervision. It's one of the most uh, incredible breakthrough, not, all, not only in the natural language, but uh, in all the machine learning world. And I completely love this uh, concept and type of doing things uh, to not uh, add 
human effort, uh, but to use the data that uh, we have. Uh, BERT used another uh, task. This is called the uh, mask the language model. I think that you know it. There is another task uh, that was used in BERT uh, at the beginning. It was the next sentence prediction. So in, during the pre-training, uh, um, he learned to uh, predict a word in the mask language model and predict the correlation between uh, two sentences in this uh, next sentence prediction. Um, a lot of studies the, um, proved that the, the, this uh, specific uh, pre-training task was not very useful. So the, the mask language model is enough. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Roberta, that was the, another version of BERT made by Facebook, uh, only use mask language model. And uh, they made a little bit, uh, let's say, larger model. And they uh, reached the state of the art just after uh, BERT. So um, after BERT, um, other models were introduced, uh, like the Electra, ExcelNet. Uh, I won't speak speak about them only because they are a little bit less used in, uh, in general. But I want to um, skip directly to uh, GPT series. Um, uh, let's say we started from BERT that are encoder. Uh, we arrived to GPT that are decoder. Finally, there is not a big difference. It's only how the transformer layer is uh, is put uh, some details. I won't. I don't want to to speak about it. But I think that the little um, improvement, not improvement, but the difference is that here uh, the pre-training task is not mask language model, but is a causal language model. So we have to predict the next word. So at the at the, at the end of the in the end of the sentence. And um, with GPT-2 and uh, even more with GPT-3, OpenAI create, uh, created the biggest uh, neural network ever trained. So that was the, the real impact. So not, not so good, let's say, but um, you, you said that you focused uh, on it in another talk, though, so that's great. Um, but I only want to speak about it in the next session when uh, I speak with um, where there are the value for uh, large, a lot of parameters and large uh, language models. The last model that I want to underline is T5. I very like T5 because it's a hybrid uh, between BERT and GPT because it is encoder plus decoder. Uh, it generates text like GPT, but is trained on masked language model like BERT. So it's really between the two. And it's very cool because uh, uh, since it generates text, uh, it's uh, very, mm, let's say, performing also in the generation tasks. Uh, instead of BERT, that is not so good in generation, is better for classification. And uh, but uh, he encodes very well the, the text, and he is very good also in classification tasks. But we will speak about uh, in the next section. Uh, only uh, one overview about these models. We see that BERT base is the smallest one, let's say. But um, still, uh, it, uh, it has uh, 12 layers, 12 uh, attention heads, uh, one, uh, 100 million parameters, uh, and the weight is uh, uh, 500 uh, megabytes. So yes, it's small, but it's not so small. Let's say that in production, when you have to handle 500 megabytes, it's not so easy. It's not like a subturbate machine that weights uh, 10, 15 megabytes, uh, and it's, you can put it in, in the database and uh, forget it, let's say. If you see the larger language models, uh, T5 XXL is uh, 50 gigabytes, um, GPT-3, we don't know, but we think uh, about uh, 700 gigabytes. So very, very, very uh, big. And so the question is, but do we need 
all these parameters uh, for a downstream task. Because finally, when we want to use this model in production in uh, real life, we have uh, a downstream task. Downstream task is, uh, well, whatever task, uh, a classification, a summarization, a, a, I don't know, um, text inference, text similarity, and so on. So a very specific task in a very specific industry in a very specific context. And so we are sure that we need all these parameters, all these big, big uh, network for doing only a single task. So this is the question, uh, um, uh, let's say the, the, the core of this talk. And uh, I want, so the next sections uh, are um, the answers and the answer is uh, no and yes. <laughs> oh, of course. So the, the first answer is no. Um, uh, sometimes we don't need all the parameters. Uh, there is a big uh, research field um, that, um, that uh, has um, a goal to compress the models. For example, if we start from a BERT model, we can uh, try to um, Put, to cut off, for example, some layer, some heads, some weights to reach a lighter model that has the same performance. The first, um, the first um, uh, technique, the classical technique, is the distillation. It's a quite funny technique because uh, you use a teacher model, as you see in the schema on the right. A teacher model, for example, can be a bird. BERT uh, base uh, uh, pre-trained. You have a teacher model and you uh, create a student model that has, for example, uh, half of the layers. And um, we, we emulate, we simulate the output uh, of, the, of, the master, of the teacher. So we, uh, we, we ask the student to make the same output of the teacher. And the cool thing that it is that the same output, it means the same um, probability, distribution probability on the, on the vocabulary that is the um, output of BERT. So it's not uh, the same output, uh, um, zero or one, uh, like the pre -train, uh, classical pre-train of, uh, of BERT. Because when we pre-train BERT, uh, we we put off uh, the word, uh, we ask it uh, to predict that word, and it's uh, true or false, let's say. So it's binary. Here we have uh, um, more uh, nuances, more shades, because uh, the teacher, um, the output of the teacher is the probability on, on the vocabulary. And so with this um, probability, we increase the speed of, uh, of the train of the train and the quality. So for example, we did it uh, for Italian. So we started from a, a BERT uh, base. We, we use it uh, a distilled BERT architecture. And finally, we reached uh, a, a model that is uh, uh, as the half of the parameters. So it's twice faster, twice lighter. It's exactly the same performances on all, all the tasks that uh, that we tried, and sometimes uh, it's even better. So that's cool. That's very good because um, that's the the first answer. Okay, maybe we only need the, the half of the parameters that we have uh, at the beginning, and that's quite a first good uh, achievement. And um, but uh, distillation is not the only compression uh, technique. Um, there is also uh, quantization that is um, an interesting trick. So we start, uh, our parameters normally are uh, floats. So are 32-bit uh, uh, numbers. The quantization, uh, the idea is, uh, OK, maybe we don't need the 32-bit uh, representation. We only need 8-bit. Uh, representation. So we map all the, the numbers in new numbers. So we finally we reduce 
the representation uh, of the numbers, we reduce the memory, and we reduce the size of the, of the network. Another technique is the pruning. Is the most maybe complicated but effective uh, uh, technique. The idea is to um, is that um, we have a lot of parameters, but when we do, for example, a fine tuning, we don't need all the parameters. Uh, we um, let's imagine a network like a lot of different areas, uh, and uh, each area learned something specific about, for example, a topic, uh, I don't know, a language area, and so on. Here, the idea is to select only the parameters in a specific area where there is the knowledge that we need. So it's quite simple. We make a fine tuning, so we make a forward. We make a back propagation, a classical back propagation, and we see where there is more uh, update in the parameters when we do back propagation. And in, with this idea, we take only the connection with more uh, in, uh, update, so that are more significant for the for the back propagation updating. And with this idea, we can remove uh, as uh, parameters as we want and keep uh, only the significant ones. With all this compression, with some other techniques and algorithms that we did, um, OK, after I, 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 I go to adapters, with all these techniques, um, we um, started uh, last year a, research uh, challenge let's call it so internally we wanted to reach a transformer model that uh, weights only 20 megabytes so that was uh, our goal at the beginning of the year and we started to work a lot and research a lot about every type of compression that we um, could made could make to reach a lightweight model super lightweight model without uh, uh, a loss of performance and uh, finally we did it we called it uh, speedo speedo because um, uh, a member of our team uh, uh, his name is edo and so since uh, i had uh, my my model that is bertino yeah we are um, very funny with the name because bertino uh, is my surname it was the only time in my life, I think, that it was perfect to call a model with my name. It was a small version of Bert, so it was incredibly, uh, it was perfect time. So for sure, uh, now we started to, to make a model for each member of the team. So we have Spedo, and uh, now we want to do Matte 5, because there is Matteo in the team and so on. So I will keep uh, you updated on the names for sure. And um, this is very cool because um, um, the idea here is to have a very small model for the fine tuning specific task. So this is not, uh, this final speedo is not a pre-trained model. So it's not a model that we can fine tune with on other task. It's the specific model fine tuned only for that task. And that's the reason that we don't need all the other parameters that we used in, uh, for other stuff. So we reduce the fine, time in, fine tuning time, uh, inference time, memory usage. We can scale it in the platform very easily, putting it uh, every, everywhere um, in the database, um, sometimes also on the edge and so on. So it changes a lot in the, let's call it DevOps uh, part side, and uh, it changed completely the performances uh, of a platform of an application like uh, like a chatbot that we have another um, little technique uh, that i come back is the adapters adapters are um, a very cool um, um, technique because uh, finally it's a technique to uh, put some feed forward between the transformer layers. So we have uh, normal uh, attention layers. Uh, imagine a 
bigger architecture like uh, T5. There are a lot, a lot of layers and a lot of parameters to update. We freeze all the transformer layers, we put feed forward between the layers, and we fine tune only the feed forwards. And that's very cool because we are adding some random weights, random initialized weights, and we are saying to the network, uh, fine tune only these little uh, cush, little layers. And um, that's very effective. It, they need a little bit more epochs, but finally you fine tune very, very, very few uh, weights. And uh, so for example, uh, we tried it and we use it to reach the same uh, accuracy of uh, the original network. You need, uh, you reduce the 50% uh, of the time. So that's, and you can use it uh, everywhere with every type of transformer architecture. Uh, BERT, T5, uh, e even GPT, I think. Uh, we don't know. Now uh, they started to uh, open AI and Microsoft, they opened the possibility to fine tune GPT-3. And I don't think that they uh, do a complete update of all the weights of GPT-3. So maybe, for example, they can use adapters because adapters you can fine tune only these weights and you can store only this little layer that you will uh, use uh, in inference. So that's a very interesting thing that you can see as compression because finally you use less weights. So in the, um, this section, uh, um, the conclusion is that um, these lightweight uh, models are very strong. For example, in classification task, uh, where you don't use uh, a lot of uh, model knowledge uh, or complexity, uh, you have a greater, greater control over the output of, of the models. So they are lighter and faster. Um, for sure uh, is, uh, only for specific tasks, single task, they need to be fine-tuned, uh, of course. Uh, it, they don't reach the state of the art because uh, finally you, okay, we minimized the loss of performance, but you, you finally, your goal is to um, decrease the, the parameters, not increase the performance. Um, now the, the, the other side, of the coin, let's say. So uh, when we need a lot of parameters uh, and we need a big, big, big uh, model. Um, I tried to resume uh, these three, uh, let's, get, let's say concepts, fields, because they are three things that were unthinkable uh, before uh, transformers and before this big, larger, larger language model. And that are uh, the multitask, the data scarcity, so the few shot uh, setting, and the multi-language. Um, I will deep dive every aspect uh, with uh, which model was the first uh, able to, to perform well in this setting. The first one was uh, T5. When T5 was um, presented, the, um, they focused in the paper about the multitask part. The multitask part is very interesting how they did it. Uh, for example, what you see here is an example of sentiment analysis. So they did, okay, since the model is a generative model, we can only gener generate text. But if we want to do sentiment classification, let's generate the label. So the input text is sentiment, the movie was good, and the output text generated is positive. So they were the first that um, started to think a classification problem like a text generation problem. And it was also uh, something used in GPT-3 and now mm, everywhere in large language models. If you want to do translation, you, you write translate English to Italian, house, and translation is Gaza. With the um, um, sentence similarity, the same thing, uh, or 
for example, question answering the same thing. Um, since every task is um, transformed in a generative task, we can use a single model to do all the tasks. And this was the, let's say, very innovative thing inside the paper. And, uh, and with this little trick, they reached the state of the art in a lot, a lot of tasks uh, at time of the publication. Even now, T5 is one of the top uh, performing uh, model in the, in the benchmarks. And um, this is about multitasking, but we can generalize also over languages. If we imagine the same thing, but uh, with different language, the model will uh, learn to do the same thing. So there is in the multitasking, there is a knowledge transferring between the language and the task. Here, there is a knowledge transferring between a language and another. So I translated uh, a little bit uh, random uh, in random languages, the, the, the task, but it's exactly what happens in the, the MT5. MT5 is the multi multilingual T5. It's the same architecture of T5, but they trained it uh, on a multilingual corpus. The corpus is called uh, MC4. It's one of the biggest corpus uh, made uh, for sure by Google to with the, I don't know, over uh, 100 languages, 130, something like that. And um, it is uh, very, very powerful. And um, when you need a large language approach in languages different from English, now MT5 is the, the best way to to proceed and to use because it's very very powerful another aspect uh, um, in another setting is the uh, zero shot and few shot so gpt3 the real innovation that he he made it made it was not the quality of the text yes it was good but it was not the focus on gpt3 the focus was the that it was able to generate and to do task in the zero shot and few shot uh, setting without uh, fine tuning. So that was very, very cool. Uh, zero shot, uh, a few shot in, in general, we need, uh, we, we, we call a few shot when we have not a lot of data. So a scarcity of data. When we have only one observation, we call it uh, one shot. Uh, if we have no observation, we do it zero shot. A zero shot uh, is it was the most astonishing uh, um, result uh, in the GPT-3 paper. So only giving the instruction, uh, for example, translating English to French, it was able to translate the word. So the zero shot and few shot um, setting was the, the innovation introduced inside the GPT-3 paper. GPT-3 does it without fine tuning, only with pre-train because until uh, one month ago, it was impossible to, to make a fine tuning. But um, uh, recent papers uh, did the same thing, but with a smaller model. So the idea is, OK, uh, GPT-3 does it without fine tuning because it's very, very big. But let's try to do the same thing with smaller model, smaller. Yeah, large language model, but not large as GPT-3. And so. Um, they try to um, to um, let's say um, make uh, to uh, leverage the language side in the generation. So this is um, an aspect that I like a lot. Um, they try to make um, the the same thing. So the zero shot generalization. Let's call it but uh, between tasks. So it's um, quite a, um, a, a mix between the multitask and the zero shot that we saw in the GPT-3. And uh, for sure, you need a lot of parameters for, to, for doing that, because you need a big model, uh, very performing in, in language modeling. But the idea is to leverage the linguistic part of the prompt 
to generalize better. So what they did is, uh, okay, we saw that in T5, for example, I uh, come back to T5, the extraction was fixed. For example, sentiment, translating English to Italian, and so on. So a fixed uh, extraction for the model. What they tried in, uh, in these two papers that are from last month, so it's very, very, very recent research, is to generalize this instruction. So instead of, of saying uh, translate from English to text, uh, say, for example, try to translate uh, from English to this type uh, Italian sentence and so on. So only uh, varying the linguistic part. And um, um, Flan was made by Google, T0, a lot of researcher from uh, a lot of um, institutes uh, and companies, but the same, quite the same thing. You see T0, they um, get the same schema of T5, and you see that, um, for example, they trained over summarization, sentiment analysis, a question answering, but they evaluated on natural language inference. That is a task that the model never saw. But since it is explained in a linguistic, in a natural language way, the model is able to understand the task and generate the response. So I think that it's uh, the last, uh, the, the last mile, the last result, uh, incredible result that the NLP community uh, reached in the, in the last months. And uh, this is the mix of everything that we discovered and uh, introduced uh, in all these uh, large language models. For sure, is they are smaller than GPT-3, but they have a lot of parameters. So they are considered um, large language model. Um, I want to uh, make a little example about how to use it in uh, in Indigo AI. So this is a open uh, research challenge that we are uh, addressing right now. So Speedo, we resolved, it was the, the, the challenge of the last year. This one is the challenge of the, this year. What we want to do is uh, zero shot uh, generalization between uh, projects. So for uh, us, a project is, uh, you can think about a chatbot, for example, no? and a virtual assistant of a bank or a pharma or something. A virtual assistant can be in every type of industry, every type of context. What we want to do is to generalize all the knowledge that we have to a new project. So imagine that you create a new project. Now you need to create a data set, uh, for sure, like a, every machine learning problem. A data set for us is example questions for some intent. So it's text classification and the observation are sentences. Um, the idea is to decrease the number the, of the sentences of the observation that you need for a new uh, project. That is the classical uh, uh, knowledge transferring uh, uh, setting, let's say. So to increase the curve, the learning curve at the beginning. The problem is that it's very challenging. Every, um, every project is a different classification. So we have different requests for every project. So for us, every classification has a different output space. So the labels are, are different. The industries are different. So even the context of asking something, so the, 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 the type of the request are very different. And also the channels. So it uh, changes also the, the length of the, of the request and so on. So um, th there, are, there is a lot of information to, um, to transfer, but it's very challenging to transfer it in the right way. Um, until I think last year it was um, impossible to think that uh, it could work, but now with this innovation of large language models, this work uh, uh, made uh, on the instruction prompt and linguistic side, we are quite uh, sure that it can work. And if it works, uh, it's a great breakthrough 
in this uh, specific uh, intent classification field. Um, so I will skip um, very fast uh, to the conclusion. So we saw the lightweight uh, on the left and the large language model on the right. And as we said, lightweight specific task, large one model to rule them all. Uh, one side classification, also multi labeled at school, large language model, better to gener for generation. Uh, lightweight, cool for the production side, large language model, better for the few shot setting uh, or when you have a high complexity language task. Only few slides to finish, I want to only underline four um, uh, research lines that are the, let's say the, um, the, the present of the research in NLP in this moment. Uh, the first uh, line is the size. Uh, as, we, as we saw, there is a, a lot of work in the compression of the models uh, in, to reach efficiency, finally, of the models. So uh, until GPT-3, it was um, everybody tried to make bigger networks. Now, everybody understood that um, it's not uh, sustainable to make bigger and bigger, it's better to uh, increase the efficiency. Uh, data, uh, maybe text uh, is not uh, the only source that we can use. Maybe uh, if we think about humans, uh, humans learn language uh, with um, words, uh, language, but also with images. So maybe adding the images, uh, computer vision information, uh, we increase the efficiency for the model to learn language. And uh, focalization or clip uh, are great example of this, uh, and it's an incredible uh, increasing uh, research field. Uh, third uh, line is the model. So as we said, maybe transformer is not the most efficient uh, way to to model language. Maybe a linear alternative uh, to transformer can be better. And uh, the last one is the language side. Uh, what we saw with the instruction uh, changing the linguistic part in the instruction is the first time when we use, we leverage language for doing language model. So um, it was incredible that until now we saw language only as a, a vector, something that was the same approach than computer vision, for example. Uh, but we have language we can leverage language so it's cool to make some uh, what's it, what is called the prompt design so make an action directly on this linguistic part finish i hope that it was not so long and i switch on the light wow thank you thank you so much it was really interesting actually i must confess that some uh, uh, part of the um, the talk, especially the the match between uh, uh, fine tuning together with attention, historically overlap at the same time. I, I was not aware of the of the papers you mentioned that are researching uh, on uh, uh, where the attention mechanism or is the fine um, the pre training the fine tuning approach the the best. Uh, uh, one for um, for the improvements we we then we then see in the, in, in language. I was not aware of, of it, so thank you from my side, and in general for for the talk. Thank you. I don't know if there are some questions from the audience, from Sebastian or or the people are attending. Feel free to to ask. I was I was curious about um, the challenge that you are. Uh doing for this year so this unified model for uh, different projects and the idea is to um, to pass in some way the information about the project to the model or simply give to the model the input text and the model has to figure out to which is the domain or the project reference um, good question uh, we don't know because we are starting right now researching on it but um, the main idea is to create a, um, 
universal classifier. So now you can see every project like a specific classifier. So imagine a bank has some request, so has a specific intent the classification for the bank request. Pharma, that's the same thing, retail and so on. But if, imagine if everything could be a, a unique um, universal classifier. So um, finally, when you um, try to recognize an intent inside a sentence, it's, uh, it's not uh, corre for, correlated with the context. If I say, I want to buy an apple, the intent is to buy a product. And you know it uh, without knowing that is retail, that is a, a bank, and so on. So the idea is to reach a, a universal, uh, universal intent classifier on top of everything, and then map this universal space into the specific space with the specific request. And it was okay, something you. impossible uh, to make it uh, before this uh, large language model with this type of skills, because it's something very hard, let's say, to, to recognize the intent uh, in every context, every application and everything. Okay, thank you. I got the idea of getting a kind of uh, general uh, universal and um, natural language understanding and then move to more specific domain or more specific project. Yeah. The, the only way to do it is to let the model generalize. So let the model generate the label in the way that uh, he wants. And that, that's the difficult part to handle because it can generate everything. And so the, we need a, a more, another step to understand what the model is generating and use it in, a, in the final pipeline. Okay, thank you. Hi, Enrico, uh, maybe last question if I, I can. Know. If we still have the time. Well, thank you for so much for an interesting presentation and for showing us a gold standard in technical presentations. Uh, so I had one question about uh, making the model lightweight. You said you started doing um, parameter pruning. And I was just curious, um, how did that improve the inference uh, time performance? Because Previously, I was reading some article about like GPUs not really being able to utilize uh, sparse network architectures because they still need like these full matrix multiplications. Uh, so did it actually improve the inference performance or was it just to reduce the size? Um, th there is a little improvement, yes. It's not the main improvement of pruning. The main improvement on inference side is the distillation because you cut off the whole layer so you reduce the half of the inference time. Pruning, you reduce a little bit the complexity of the products uh, inside the attention, uh, attention layers. But uh, yeah, it's not so, um, so big the difference. The big difference is the weights of the model, let's say. Okay, thank you very much. But it's a good, uh, good question. No more questions? Last chance. No. So then, thank you again, Enrico. That was a really interesting talk. Um, thanks for taking it from the grounds up all the way to the most applied, most modern, most clever ideas. It was great to hear um, that that you're working on this and that you're doing your own experiments and to hear your report about what uh, what findings you have. This is uh, interesting to us too at PySchool. school. And um, so we'll, um, the, the fellows on session nine will now carry on in another meeting room where we, uh, we have project meetings after this. To the rest of you, I'm saying good evening. Thank you so much and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian.